Well, thank you very much for coming out. And um, I want to point out that the first image on my title slide was put up there uh, weeks ago and therefore demonstrates our incredible ability to predict the weather. Uh, <laughs> it, it, in truth, uh, I just like this photo a lot, so um, it just happens to align reasonably well with the, the weather that we're getting. So I'm not going to claim any skill in predicting, but it is kind of funny that that's the way it worked out. So again, thank you for coming out on a Saturday. You know, a lot of people like to take the weekend off and uh, veg out, and uh, I very, very much appreciate you guys coming out to listen to what I have to say. Um, so let me give you a little outline. Uh, it, I'm going to have some demos and things. Uh, demos are uh, one of the scariest words in computer science because they almost always go south. <laughs> so I'm working without a net. So you know you may you may see some results of that. But basically, I'm going to try to explain to you what we mean when we say computational science. You know, science used to be sort of pencils and papers, theories and uh, test tubes. We added computers some time ago to that mix. Uh, what does that look like? I'm going to talk about uh, the quest I've been on with a lot of colleagues uh, in, in the discipline and here at NCAR to get parallel algorithms and systems. And I'll explain what parallel means, but that's our way of tackling these big problems. Uh, the recognition of the fact that we need a new facility to fit the big computers that we need to do this. And, how that took uh, uh, basically 10 years out of my life. Uh, uh, a few, a discussion of the few dark clouds on the horizon. Uh, we're, running, we're running out of, uh, you know, the trends that have powered us for the last half century, and what are we going to do next? Uh, the next thing I'm going to uh, sort of allude to is a possible uh, path forward is artificial intelligence. And uh, you know, those of you who remember the HAL 9000 computer and all of the science fiction associated with this will probably see the pluses and minuses of that avenue. Uh, the supercomputer in your pocket section, I will talk about these amazing little things uh, in, that are called Raspberry Pis and how we're using them for education and uh, outreach and training to get people interested in this business. Uh, and we'll talk about new ways to interact with data. So that will cover augmented reality uh, and using sound to represent data. So we will have uh, some uh, musical composition composed by the Earth system itself for you to listen to. And then finally, uh, I felt obligated as part of this, and since it's supposed to be an explorer series, and I suppose that means I'm supposed to be the explorer, I thought I would just sort of convey to you why I find this stuff um, worthy of devoting your life to. You know, why am I doing what I'm doing? What do I, why do I care about it? And it's, it's really because I think at, at some point you realize that this, this whole set of phenomena is just very beautiful. So I will go there. So how do supercomputers help science? You know, they're relatively new to the scientific uh, experience. Well, you start with a problem. Uh, in this case, we're interested in, in how the Earth works. Uh, and uh, what we do, basically, is describe this through a set of mathematical equations, physical laws that we tend to believe are true. We write them down. And this is the only equation in this talk. And you can't, this set of equations, you can't actually read them. But, uh, and that's a good thing, actually. <laughs> All right. So then what we do is we take those equations and we translate them into algorithms and programs that a computer can understand. Uh, and that's what that looks like. And I won't be explaining that diagram either. Uh, and you get input data. So it's a bunch of numbers. Perhaps that represents the initial state of the atmosphere, what the temperature fields and, and pressure fields look like. And then we feed that all into a supercomputer. And here's our latest supercomputer, which is Cheyenne. I'll be talking more about that. But basically, the data and the, and the algorithms go in. And out come some results. Uh, generally speaking, we get too many results, uh, too many results to look at or think about. And that has gotten worse and worse as we've gone along. So 
Uh, you may have heard of the concept of big data or too big data. Those, those issues come out there. And then we move on to some kind of uh, analysis process that extracts out some curves and plots that we, we show to each other. And then somebody comes along with a pencil and makes a check mark and says, yes, maybe it's not a pencil. It might be a fountain pen. But the point is, we come along and go, yes, uh, that agrees with what we're seeing in the Earth, uh, or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, that's actually more interesting, because then it sets off a series of very polite uh, arguments amongst the scientists as to why that is, and then that fuels perhaps modifications. And so you can think of this as a kind of tail chasing exercise that we've been doing since we got our first uh, set of computers uh, uh, working on this problem roughly around 1950. So that's how computers can kind of help us do this stuff. So, what does it mean when we say we're going to model the Earth system? Well, this little picture which includes, I would point out, a deer. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure we have a deer in the equations, but the point is that there's a great deal of uh, interaction between uh, different processes in the Earth system. You have ice floating around, you have oceans, you have water running off. Excuse me while I try to navigate this arrow. You have water running off the land. Uh, it snows in the mountains, which is what's happening to us right now. Uh, and all, the sun shines on all this and kind of fires it all up. And all these processes have to be accounted for in a complete description of the Earth system. And that's a tall order. Um, and you will see here that also that, which is a human power plant, let's say, is with emissions, that also has to be factored into the research if we're going to have any relevance to what's actually going on. Now, how we actually do, do this is we chop this all in the Earth into a bunch of blocks. You can think of those as, uh, you know, let's say little chunks of latitude and longitude. And you'd say, this block we will consider as a single point, and we will model the system relative to that set of points. And as you can see, what we also have to do since the atmosphere has a vertical extent, we have a kind of stack of these points. Similarly in the ocean. So if you think about all this, we digitize this all up, and we apply these local laws in these boxes, and then we calculate essentially the rates of change of the variables that we care about. And those rates of change then allow us to kind of march forward in time. So for example, well, this just says air column and water column. 1969, uh, scientists here at INCAR, who's, who's still uh, coming into work, uh, Warren Washington uh, and his colleagues put together the first uh, uh, model, at least for, at, at INCAR, that looked like a global atmospheric model. This uh, is a piece of uh, visualization of that model. It had basically only the atmosphere. One single point covered 500 kilometer box on a side, which means that the state of Colorado got one box. Now here's a question for you. You know that Colorado's half flat and half mountains. So a really good question is, what did that box get to describe Colorado? Was it mountains or you know, prairies? Uh, whichever one it got, it was half wrong, right? Because you didn't. <laughs> You didn't resolve the other thing. So that's a problem. But this was the first model. This was state of the art uh, basically 50 years ago. And uh, the vertical, we had six layers. That was all that that model had. Now, when I got here, roughly 20 years later, we'd made a little progress. We'd whittled this down to where Colorado got four points, basically. And we had increased the number of layers from 6 to 18. Uh, and one of the things that was holding us back was the fact that uh, these models were using algorithms that were not particularly local and did not particularly uh, speed up fast enough to allow us to do more complicated simulations. So. Um, you know, when I, when I arrived here, I'd been inculcated with this idea that 
uh, we need to think in parallel. And, and so parallel computing is really about dividing work up amongst lots of different workers and having them work together. That's why I have a beehive, because bees don't send one bee out at a time to look for honey. They all go out and look. Well, they don't look for honey. They look for pollen, and they bring it back and make it into honey. But the point is they send them out in waves, and they all work together for the common good. So it turns out that this whole thing of how to keep thousands of workers or let's say hundreds of thousands of workers working on a task together cooperatively, uh, we call that parallel computing. So uh, with that in mind, this is the part where I quiz the audience. OK, so these are two household items you probably have become familiar with. Uh, so my question is, which one of these is a, is a parallel device, and which one is uh, not? S anybody? <laughs> All right, the comb. And why? Because uh, a comb it allows you to comb many hairs at one time. If you combed your hair with a toothpick, you would find out <laughs> The disadvantage of a serial comb. Right? So essentially, somebody a long time ago says, I think I can parallelize the toothpick by putting a lot of them on a single thing, and I will call it the comb. And that, that person you, you know, probably made a lot of money. Uh, this, on the other hand, uh, a hammer. Although somebody, I, I showed this once, and somebody showed me a picture of a two-headed hammer. <laughs> and, I was, and I was like, well, there, there are limits to everything. OK. But you know, typically, you only drive one nail at a time with a hammer, and so it's, a, it's not. So here's another one. My wife is a knitter, so she can answer this question. Uh, you know, Which of these is parallel? A loom? That's supposed to be a loom. It's uh, safe for ages nine and above, for some reason. <laughs> uh, I guess that's so you don't weave your hair into it or something. But the bottom line is, which of these now is the fa uh, which of these is parallel? The loom. Right, very good. You guys are, are <laughs> you've now learned everything I know about parallel computing. Uh, so knitting, you do one stitch at a time. It takes forever to make a sweater. With a loom, it's an industrial process. And actually, the interesting thing about the loom is that back in the Industrial Revolution, people uh, realized it was really a painting to create patterns with a loom by changing the threads and so forth to make the, weave the pattern in. And so they said, we need to automate that. And so they started to create programs for looms that were driven by paper tapes. Uh, and so those paper tapes told the loom what to weave in to automate the process of making patterns. And coincidentally, the first uh, mechanism back when I was a, an undergraduate for loading a program into a computer was a paper tape. And that's not a coincidence. The computers inherited some of this technology about cards or paper tapes from the uh, weaving industry. So there you go. So this is my first serious loom. Uh, when I got here at Incar, uh, this is the, I say, the coolest looking supercomputer ever, I ever programmed. And you have to say, this is the, as far as I know, the only supercomputer is in, the, in a museum of art. Uh, it, and it looked really cool. If you ever saw Jurassic Park, there's a evil supercomputer that's sequencing the DNA of the dinosaurs who run amok. Uh, that that was this machine. Actually, the descendant of it, but it's the same architecture. It was uh, really pretty avant-garde. It, uh, it had 64,000 processors, which was unheard of at, at the time. And it was able to do 28 billion uh, math operations per second. And as you will come to see, that is a really pathetic number. <laughs> but in the day, in 1987, I was uh, I was just amazed by it, by this thing, and I couldn't actually believe that it that that it actually was not a prop for a science fiction movie. It was actually a computer. Uh, it was uh, 
what we call single instruction multiple data. The best way to understand that kind of architecture is all the processors work in lockstep like a bunch of soldiers marching together. So everything, uh, every computer processor in the machine executes the same instruction at the same time. Uh, and that, uh, that means that there is one master processor which is telling all of them what to do. <laughs> right, so very sorry to go into a German exit. All right, so, uh, you know, my job was to take NCAR's climate model and port to that. And that was largely uh, difficult because we really didn't have 64,000 degrees of freedom in the models we were working with. So this was a limited success, but uh, as, as a project, but I learned a lot about getting after the, what we needed in order to make progress. So I, we started uh, looking around for scalable algorithms and uh, you know, eventually the idea of, of working with something called spectral elements, it's a numerical method, it's very accurate, it's quite local. So the laws of physics are local laws. They just tell you how to update your local grid point and the idea was to get something that had those properties in an algorithm. And this one, there were lots of intense calculations in this little patch, and then little amounts of communication with their neighbors. And we had to put that on a sphere, but they're all square. So we immediately dealt with a, a problem that everybody's heard of, which is putting a round peg in a square hole. So how do you put a cube onto a sphere? Well, you take a, a, something like a Rubik's cube and you mathematically inflate it uh, to, to make it fit on the sphere, and that's what you, you get, this kind of thing we call a cube sphere. Uh, you know, one of the nice things about that compared to the other models uh, at the time, oops, I'm jumping ahead, was that you get quasi-uniform distribution of points. This color is just showing you that the, the way points are distributed uh, bunches up only a little bit. And then this is a fun game, uh, and, and literally we, we thought about this problem in the way you would, you would think about a packing box. You know, it's mash this thing out flat, and then let's try and figure out how we can uh, break it up into little pieces so each processor can work on a, on a piece. And in this case, we're looking at uh, eight processors with eight different colors and a, an algorithm that I won't explain, but that we use to divide that up. So the whole idea was to get the same amount of work on each processor, so roughly when they finish doing something, they finish at the same time, so they can then work on the next thing. Ah, and so my uh, next really significant machine uh, was an IBM machine called the Blue Genial. And it, it was not damaged in shipment. It, it actually did lean like that. <laughs> it's not, you know, it, it looked like perhaps maybe somebody dropped it or something. But this, this machine um, really had some nice properties to it. It um, was very scalable. Uh, it's interesting, though, the, you look at the number of processors, it actually has dropped down to just 2,000 processors. But look how much faster it is. You remember I was working on 28 billion? This is now 100 times uh, faster than that uh, in 2005. So this machine, and this is a very small test system. There are many times bigger machines uh, at uh, Lawrence Livermore, for example, had a had a machine with many of these racks. But our whole objective with this uh, was to map this algorithm with the round peg in the square hole cube sphere thing, map that onto this machine and, and uh, use these algorithms to try and make it as parallel as possible. And I'm trying here desperately to lean to make it look as if it were straight up and down. Uh, so very interesting uh, machine. Now, as we started to look at this parallelism thing, we realized we're going to need a bigger facility. If we're going to make the next jump in computing that we think we need to make in order to take these parallel algorithms and now apply them on really big machines with lots of processors, 
uh, the machine room, which is downstairs, and you can look into it, and you'll see it's pretty much empty at the moment. Uh, that's where all our super, that's where this picture was taken. That's in the downstairs. That room was built in the 70s and just couldn't handle the size of machine, order megawatts machines that we needed. So I brought this up with the idea that we'd order a new facility and it would be delivered in a couple weeks. Uh, and <laughs> and uh, I discovered that that's a lot longer process. So I brought up the need for a facility in October of 2003. And in o October of 2012, the facility was commissioned and put into service. And there is a ca you know a huge number of people that uh, got involved because uh, this is involved a great deal of engineering design, uh, and it's outside Cheyenne, Wyoming. If you go up there, you can go in and take a tour. We have a nice visitor center. Uh, that's a picture of the facility, and if you go up there, this is really the people piece, and the machine sits back here in the back, in that in that kind of box. Very proud of this. Uh, the first machine we put in there it was 30 times faster than the machine we had uh, on the NCAR campus at the time here in the Mesa lab. This machine we named Yellowstone in tribute to Wyoming. Now, this number is always problematic because people are like, is that the national debt or what is, what is this number? <laughs> this, this is one and a half quadrillion math operations per second. Okay, so uh, it, you know a quadrillion is a million billion. So if you think of a one and a half million billion as opposed to twenty-eight billion, that's how much performance we've gone up. And the, and the way the performance moves in this business, roughly a factor of a thousand every decade. There's nothing like that anywhere else in technology. I, I, you know, I always like to say, between the Wright brothers, if you were to do a thousand factor of improvement in flight uh, in this in a decade, it would mean be that World War I would have had F-18 fighter jets deployed, which would have given us a decided advantage. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose just flying by would rip the wings off the other airplanes. But the point is, factor of a thousand, you know, airplanes have made a lot of progress over the years, but it's nothing compared to computers. So, you know, I mentioned here that uh, it has 72,000 processors, so we finally have gone by what this connection machine was first like. Uh, and I say it has a fat tree interconnect, and people are like, what is that? So uh, it's, uh, it's not quite this, uh, but it is related to this. If, as an analogy, if you think of the leaves as processors and the branches in the trunk as communication fabric. Uh, so here are processors down here at the bottom and then switch elements. You notice the links between the switches get faster. So this thing now looks uh, like an upside down tree and that's why it's called a, a fat tree. And Really, this interconnects what makes a supercomputer a computer. These processors that we use, not all that different from the processors you might find in this laptop uh, on a per computing element basis. What makes a supercomputer are these links. That, that allows them to work together in parallel. So the, an individual, I'll show you a picture. This is the top of Yellowstone, and this stuff that looks like orange vermicelli down here this, uh, all of that stuff are those, those cables. Each cable is about 8,000 times faster than a DSL line. And I always say in this picture that it, it illustrates the importance of labeling your cables. Because <laughs> if you don't, uh, you're in deep trouble trying to, you don't want to be doing this. Okay, so I want to show you what a, what a uh, petascale, so petascale means a machine that can do a quadrillion math operation. So I just want to show you what a petascale uh, model can do. This is a model for prediction across scales. And um, you will see some things forming in here like this, 
that is a cyclone. You will, if you watch that, it'll smack Somalia, and it will actually form an eye. See, there's a little eye there. There's another hurricane over here smacking into uh, Southeast Asia. See the eye forming there? So this is a four kilometer resolution model. Uh, some people, when I show this picture, say, well, OK, this is satellite imagery. What does the model look like? This is the model. So this, uh, this level of realism is the result of applying that kind of computing power to the problem with these very simple equations applied just to the local grid points. These grid points now, Colorado probably has on the order of, uh, at that resolution, has something on the order of 10,000 grid points instead of one or four. So that does. Now, if you're a real expert, you know what these dates mean. Uh, around Halloween in 2012. Anybody know what happened then? E yes, I heard it. Now oh, that's that's Steve Thomas. That's a ringer. I'll give you five bucks later. <laughs> Steve Thomas is one of my colleagues that worked on the spectrum and stuff, so he's feeding. Yeah, Sandy, if you actually watch this, and I won't show it again, but if you watch this, Sandy doesn't happen here. The scientist that was doing this experiment was trying to understand the sensitivity of hurricane formation or cyclone formation to initial conditions. So this is a reality that didn't happen in which Sandy didn't happen. The other two hurricanes really did happen. Or one was called Murjan and the other was called Son Tin. Uh, Son Tin hit Vietnam, Murjan hit um, Somalia. But uh, what, what he is uh, investigating here is something that you may have heard of the, the butterfly effect or the sensitivity to initial conditions. This is a reality in which the initial conditions are a little bit different. And the two hurricanes happen in one spot of the world the way they really did, roughly. But Sandy doesn't happen in this reality. So I'm sure the people in New Jersey would like to click on this reality and have replay it that way. but. It, it shows you that um, which way the atmosphere goes and what it actually ends up doing is very sensitive to the state that it, it's in. And that's really one of the reasons why our ability to predict the weather is somewhat limited. And I'll just, oh, yeah, here we go. So I just wanted to, this is not actually four kilometer resolution, but that's the kind of grid that we use in this impasse model. Uh, and it's a kind of a, geodesic grid, you see a bunch of uh, hexagons like a honeycomb, uh, and that's sort of a feeling for what kind of grid is underneath there. So here's Cheyenne, that's our newest computer. We, we deployed that um, to, right at the beginning of 2017. Uh, it is 5.4 quadrillion operations a second, so it's three times faster than Yellowstone. Uh, you will see we've doubled the number of processors here roughly to uh, 145,000. Now, you want something excruciatingly difficult to do. Get 145,000 of anything to work together. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's uh, like exponentially difficult cat herding, all right? So this, this scaling applications to that level of of supercomputers is quite, quite a challenge. So here's some of the dark clouds. Uh, how much smaller can we make a transistor? Uh, the first transistor that I'm showing up there in the upper left-hand corner was basically the size of your thumb. It was invented in uh, Bell Labs in New Jersey, where my wife's mother worked. I think she, she actually invented the transistor, if I remember, and then they took the credit. But anyway, the point is, <laughs> that may not be true, but, but she made, she, uh, she was part of it, you know, uh, in the lab there. Anyway, so this thing about the size of your thumb, this is an electron micrograph of, so my electron microscope picture of a single transistor in a modern, um, what they call a field effect transistor in a modern 
uh, you know, chip. Uh, this is about 200 atoms across. Uh, and if you look at this, this, this little thing at the bottom, that's the insulation that basically keeps the thing from shorting out. So the gate and the substrate, there's a voltage potential across there. And that little thin thing is only 10 atoms across. Uh, that's not a lot of atoms. Uh, if you misplace an atom, somehow it's 10% thinner. Uh, that's pretty scary. This is a problem that was that has been dealt with over the past few years. This was getting so thin that electrons were quantum tunneling through this barrier and leaking through, and that was causing the chips to heat up. Uh, this was dealt with, and I won't explain how, uh, within the laws of physics, I should say, because it's a it's a product on the market. But uh, you know, to deal with that. Uh, is one of the reasons why our computer, uh, Cheyenne, isn't drawing way more electricity than it is, because they, they dealt with that kind of an issue. So when we talk about quantum mechanics, uh, there really are quantum engineers who have to worry about designing these kind of structures. But my question is, though, at some point, you can keep shrinking this indefinitely. You know, we're, we shrank this down from an inch and a half down to 200 atoms across, at some point we're going to be played out. That's a worry. Uh, so are we at the end of modeling? There's some other problems here. The processors uh, have not been getting faster. We've just been getting more of them. And I told you 145,000 is horrible to uh, control. What if you have to control 10 million of them? At some point, the, the processor synchronization issues the ability for them to talk to each other becomes problematic. Uh, we've kind of used up a lot of the parallelism that we have available, so that's not available to us as much to speed up. And our models are getting more complicated. Uh, you know, scientists love putting all kinds of uh, physics in about, you know, they want to put the deer, deers and, and flowers and whatever else they can think of into the model to make it more complex. All of that ends up with subroutines and things that could break, and so the complexity is getting us. And then these things spew out a lot of data. So I'm just a beam of sunshine here. Uh, but you know, unless we think about new ways forward, just like I kind of thought about massive parallelism as a way forward, we need to think about new ways forward to keep moving ahead. So, basic question, can artificial intelligence do more than beat us at Jeopardy? Uh, and that's an actual picture of it clobbering two human champions. Uh, you know, so the question is, how can we apply that? And what is AI anyway? So, this is sort of a taxonomy here. Uh, AI is kind of an umbrella term that refers to uh, teaching computers to perform human tasks. Uh, there's a branch of this, it's called Expert Systems, which is um, essentially working with human-specified rules and working autonomously on problems. Uh, so, for example, an expert system might be a cost estimation system that automatically comes up with the best configuration for a computer installation, for example. Uh, machine learning. These are algorithms that you know are able to actually learn from data how to perform tasks, and I'll show you an example of that. Uh, deep learning is something in which people have taken neural networks. So these are computer models, uh, computer algorithms that model the human brain. And, and a set of neurons, and you know that there, we have multiple layers of neurons in our brains. Deep learning just means we have a deep set of neural network connections that allow us to create a learning machine, basically, a la a human brain. So here's an example of this stuff being applied to real, to real data. There's some little red. Uh, squares here, what people are doing is like, instead of having people look at pictures and say, 
you, you know, as I did with the, the uh, globe there, I said, oh, look, there's a hurricane over here. Well, can a machine look and say, oh, this is a hurricane over here? So these little boxes are the machine identifying some feature. I won't go into that. But features that uh, a human would have had to look at and say, that's an interesting block. So a group at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory and NERSC have been doing this kind of stuff. And they've been trying to use it to identify things like tropical cyclones, fronts, uh, atmospheric rivers. These are streams of moisture that come up from uh, the tropics and smack into the, let's say, California. It's things called the Pineapple Express fall into that category. They hand labeled the data, so they go, computer, that's a hurricane, and that's a hurricane, and that's a hurricane. And it goes, OK, OK, I got it, I got it. And then you show it another thing. You show it a picture of a dog, and it says, that's a hurricane. And you say, bad computer, no. <laughs> you give it 100,000 hurricanes, and, and eventually it, it's a, it gets very good at recognizing hurricanes. All right, so here's, a, here's an actual application of this stuff. Uh, and what this is is some work that a colleague uh, here at NCAR named DJ Gagne has been working on, and that's showing a neural network as a value add to a model output. So you run the model, it shows there's a line of thunderstorms from stretching from Denver to Nebraska. What's the chance of some of those having hail? Well, this neural network has been trained uh, with other high resolution models to identify damaging hail conditions. And it, it looks at this uh, model output and gives you a better probability of damaging hail. So what is this convolutional neural network? OK, so it's cats and dogs here, right? But the idea is there are multiple layers of these neural networks. There's a big pile of cats and dogs. And we've ta taught it by comparing local features and then less local features in the next layer and more uh, broadly applicable features. Uh, you know. So e within each layer of the neural network, we're in a sense looking at abstractions of more uh, larger patches of what makes a dog's face different than a cat's face. So all these things have weights that they apply to the inputs to determine the outputs that will be passed on to the next layer. The output of this thing is like, OK, is this a cat or a dog? And you know, the really funny part about this is, is that they're very good at identifying cats and dogs. But we don't have quite as clean a picture. We have you know, weather looks like green and yellow and blobs. They're, they're not well defined. Uh, as, as dogs and cats both have two ears, but thunderstorms don't have anything like ears. So what does that actually translate into? So it's, a, it's an interesting thing uh, that we've actually now got neural networks that can do a better job at predicting damaging hail. And uh, this has been operationalized uh, in various weather prediction uh, systems. Uh, and, and validated relative to not only uh, the verification criteria that people use, but also the experience of the professional forecasters. Now, one of the interesting, I find this really interesting. So there's uh, Bla any Blade Runner fans in the audience. OK, do neural nets dream of electric hailstorms? Uh, one of the things you can do with this thing is you look at this little network that you have, run it. You can ask the neural network by running it backwards. What's your idea of a perfect hailstorm? It's like, what's your dream hailstorm? And it coughs up something that looks like this. Now, this is at different levels of the atmosphere, but warm, moist air, a certain amount of rotation at the mid-level. And um, you know the top, the top of this thing getting colder. All of that stuff. Uh, looks like a super supercell, which is what we intuitively associate with a hailstorm. So from a, I guess the best way to say it is the, the neural network 
is learning something that we think makes physical sense. It's, it's not just saying, well, it has to be Tuesday for it to be a hailstorm. You know, it's not bringing in extraneous factors. It's actually capturing the real structure of a real hailstorm. And that's uh, very reassuring in the sense that it's on the right track scientifically. So parameterization uh, and emulation, this is where we get rid of human crafted physics and we stick one of these neural network emulators in its place. And then we use that to advance the time level. Now, there's no plan to replace Isaac Newton with a robot. <laughs> and I would say that, um, you know, we, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had to put that in there. Just <laughs> physical law is still right. I think uh, you know our, the sort of hypothesis I'm working against with this stuff is that uh, you know we'll use physical law that we know is right, like conservation of mass and momentum, conservation of energy, those sorts of things, where it's appropriate. But the places where we're doing guesswork, or where it's drudgery to find hurricanes by hand, we're going to bring machine learning in to help deal with that stuff. And so machines, historically, have been labor-saving devices and things that amplify what we can do. That's what we call a mechanical advantage. You know, the, the whole way a screwdriver works is by making us somehow stronger by, by using the tool. And that's what I think uh, machine learning will do. So supercomputer in your pocket. Yes, this is, uh, this is uh, Everybody that has a smartphone kind of doesn't realize how uh, amazing it is, although judging by the way people seem to walk around worshiping them, uh, <laughs> perhaps we do. Uh, this, uh, this, you will see a demonstration of this outside. Uh, this is uh, a thing that we started uh, doing for education outreach. Um, these cost $35, each one of these cards. It's about the size of a, a phone. Uh, it has a phone processor in it, actually, a Broadcom uh, ARM processor. This whole thing costs about 200 bucks, fully configured. Uh, we've been using this um, to teach students and to teach faculty how to, uh, how to work with supercomputers. And believe it or not, we put the same software we put on Cheyenne uh, people can program them in the same way, and uh, they're they're really a tremendous way to lower the barrier for doing for doing science. The interesting thing is this little thing would have been on the top 500 fastest supercomputer list 20 years ago, 1998. This this right here, and that machine probably cost 10 million dollars or something. So when you next time you misplace your cell phone. You should realize it's two or three million dollars worth of 1998 supercomputer you just lost. So you might want to think about keeping track of it. But it does tell you something about how far we've come. All this stuff that we do on our phone really was was sort of stuff confined to supercomputing labs uh, 20 just 20 years ago. So it begs the question: Where are we going to be in 20 years? You know. This, by the way, is a simulation of Hurricane Harvey run on, on the uh, Raspberry Pi cluster that you'll see out in the reception area. It didn't quite do as well as the NOAA supercomputers, which are much bigger, the, weather, the National Weather Service predictions. But it showed Houston getting hit by uh, roughly three feet of rain. Uh, and uh, it, you know, it was a reasonably good forecast this is using initialized data from NOAA and then running that forward model to do the forecast. So this machine essentially is a weather, uh, uh, weather simulation platform, runs our essentially the model that, that would be used in production at NWP Center. Uh, we're using the, these to train faculty. I think I mentioned that. Uh, we targeted. Um, a minority serving college in, Mi in Miami called Miami Dade College. It serves the greater Miami area. It has 100,000 students in it. These, uh, 
these uh, are our group of people who went down there for this training. We've now done this two years in a row. The faculty are standing in the back. But you know, for, there is a kind of digital divide that a $200 computer can bridge. And I've seen it, uh, I've seen these things build resume line items for people who got jobs at Apple and Google and uh, stuff like that. So it's a, it's a game changer for students in terms of getting access to and experience with high performance stuff. All right, so bring on the demo. We were, so Pokemon Planet, uh, our Medio AR. So we started looking at augmented reality and one of, uh, one of our student interns who actually is in the audience, you know, he, uh, Nihant, uh, started working on this project to put uh, augmented reality, and I'll show you what that is in a second. Uh, our simulations, which normally you'd have to come to our visualization lab to look at, started to put them as 3D virtual objects onto a computer, like a handheld computer, like your phone or, or a tablet. So what I'm gonna do, is I'm going to press this easy button here, which will switch this over. You're now looking at this tablet. Hopefully, well, you know how this goes. I'll try to take some slack up because I have a feeling that that's going to give us some problems. So what I'm going to do, you hopefully, oh, I. It reverted back. It lost the signal. Sneaky thing. Okay, there you go. And if I actually can get my hand away from the device, I'll move this around. And I'll point this up. See, I've just created a virtual globe. Right? And I can make it bigger. See, I'm I'm making it bigger just by that. And if you look, you see it's moving? That's a movie, it's not a still picture. I can look at the North Pole. I can look at any I can move it basically anywhere I want. So now there's that hurricane I mentioned that that hit see there's another hurricane hitting uh, that's a cyclone hitting India there at the top. So the nice thing about this experience, I can also do this. This is Odile. This is not moving. This is a static thing. This hurricane hit uh, Baja, California in 2014. You can look at this um, moisture as a function of height. So I can look at that from the side from any angle, or I can look at it from the top down. You see that it, it looks a bit like um, a Danish, <laughs> you know, <laughs> there, right, a roll. So that's the hurricane aspect of it. So all of this uh, basically allows us to communicate the science we're doing in, in 3D and interactively on a handheld device. Now, uh, when you leave here, there are some cards, and you can freely download this for uh, Apple or Andro iOS or Android platforms, depending on which of those two religions you subscribe to. And you can play around with this. You can download these. You can get access to these kind of apps. Oh, well, there's a VR form of it in which you can basically view it with no background. One of the things is, is it's uh, actually been my experience that, well, I, we have people, pictures of people holding there. So it's a mu it, having it pop up like that is a much, um, uh, you know, it just adds something to the experience. So. But you can do it either way. I think it gives you a better sense of the 3D-ness of what you're seeing. You just see it on the flat background the 3D aspect of it. So uh, as you can see from this, I'll switch back. As you can see from this picture, the globe industry is about to go out of business. 
uh, if it hasn't already. But I mean, really, you do not, you know, you don't need to invest in uh, these kind of physical objects anymore. But for us, this really liberated these uh, simulations. So apart from that kind of demo, what can this stuff do? Um, so one of the things we're looking at is using these kind of augmented reality movies as outputs from, let's say, a fire model. This happens to be a model of, of Yarnell Hill fire that uh, took the lives of uh, 19 firefighters. Uh, and the idea here would be being able to run a fire model, put a movie which has got this 3D-ness in it, uh, and then allowing people uh, you know, as responders to look at that interactively in three dimensions. This is another example of how this can be used. This is from the Weather Channel. They did not build a tank on the set and immerse this car underwater. This is all augmented reality showing for a storm surge how deep underwater your car is going to be. Some people just do not get the idea of what six feet of water means to their car. This gets it across in a visceral way that perhaps you should you know, move to higher ground. Now, this is the, this is the next uh, of my uh, demos. Okay? So what, I, what you're going to have here is the sound of climate. So uh, we, we have created a kind of uh, climate orchestra that um, in which the following uh, sections of the orchestra represent different things. So temperature will be played today by the clarinet. Uh, precipitation will be the marimbas. Uh, the sea ice will be represented by a violin, and the CO2 level of the future climate will be represented by piano chords. And the pianos will shift from major to minor chords to deliver a sense of ominous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish I were making this. So, <laughs> so that that whole thing, okay, is that? Uh, let me see. I lost my. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Okay, so red here is temperature. And we're moving through time. As you can see, the year is going by. This is just temperature. And CO2, remember, is the piano, and it's shifting into more and more tense sounding chords. So this is sea ice, so we're looking at the sea ice. I swear this sounds like the beginning of a Who song. But anyway, the green is sea ice, and you can see that the sea ice will be disappearing sometime, and it drops away. And the piano tune is just left. So the CO2 again is... Okay, now we're looking at precipitation. This is the one that's the most like Philip Glass, because the precipitation doesn't do anything. <laughs> really. And my, apo my apologies to Philip Glass if he's listening in. Uh, okay, so there's not much of an anomaly associated with precipitation in this ensemble of climate simulations. Okay. And I think this is them all playing together. This is all three together. So this is a, a yet another way of communicating uh, uh, data. So why am I uh, why am I doing all of this? Because it isn't your you know it's like they said the Oldsmobile. It's not your your father's Oldsmobile. This is not your father's supercomputing. You know 
we're moving into an era where we're trying to communicate with people who themselves have a kind of supercomputer from 20 years ago. We're also trying to be mindful of the fact that there are visually impaired people who can't see what we're talking about when we show augmented reality. So trying to, ch trying to reach people in more immediate ways and communicate what's in this massive amount of data uh, much more directly. And then I just want to end with this meditation on uh, some of the things that uh, have motivated me. So basics, there's a book, I recommend you read it if you're interested in, in science. Uh, it's called um, A Beautiful Question. It's by Frank Wilczek. He's a particle physicist. He's developed the theory of the strong nuclear force. He was a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, and he's asked these questions that have come up before in our history of science. Why is the world mathematical? Why does mathematics work so well? Uh, why, when we do this math, is it so beautiful? And, and at the, the origin of beauty is something he focuses on a great deal in that book. And this is the one that's fascinated me. I mean, you write down these equations in a, in a piece of code, you run them, and out comes hurricanes spontaneously. I've been asked people like, how do you insert the hurricanes into the model? And it's like, I just write down what Newton says, and I push a button, and the hurricane just appears on its own. Uh, but thunderstorms, the Gulf Stream, everything like that. This is a little simulation that reflects that. This is showing a, a high resolution coupled climate simulation. So the atmosphere is not visible here, but the colors show the sea surface temperatures of the ocean. If you look down here, you can see this is the Gulf Stream, this thing that looks like an artery with all those meanders that's pumping warm water up the east coast of the United States. You can see the ice is declining and then begins uh, to come back in November. Uh, all of this stuff comes out of the equations. and. You know, you look at this on other planets. Uh, this is Jupiter. This looks like something Van Gogh would have painted. Uh, the interesting thing there is if you look at that, that little tiny hurricane there uh, is about half the size of planet Earth. Uh, so they have really big, and that's not even to mention this thing. So they're really big hurricanes on Jupiter. Uh, here's, a, here's a moon of Saturn called Titan. Uh, these are, it's a grainy picture, but it's a miracle we have any pictures of the surface of Titan. This is showing these dark areas. Those are oceans made out of liquid na uh, natural gas. The interesting thing is we've taken climate models, changed the working fluid to essentially liquefied natural gas, and gotten reasonable climate models for Titan. Ice caps, this giant thing that looks like a Cinnabon, is actually the North Pole of uh, Mars. Uh, so we're not the only ones with polar ice caps. These are partly out of dry ice and partly out of water. Um, but just extraordinary beauty. This, of course, is the planet that has its all, it, it all the Earth, which is of incomparable beauty. And then, you know, this is so showing we're changing the Earth. And we're making it into something slightly less friendly to human beings. This is 1990, moisture in the atmosphere. This is what the models show the future to look like in a lot more moisture. And if you look at the size and the strength of the kinds of tropical cyclones that are coming out of that model, it's a little bit frightening. And with that, I want to thank you and take any questions you might have.